Well, good evening and good morning to you all watching in the cafe. I can't begin to tell you how much fun it is for me to be here with you today. You may not know it, but I had the blessing of having just a small part in you as Gentile believers being welcomed into this family called the church. My name is James, and I'm the bishop of all the churches in and around Jerusalem. You may know me from the letter that bears my name in the New Testament. It begins with these words, James, servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Imagine that, me. From one who wrestled with him as a child to one who resented him as an adult, now one called to serve and lead his church. I didn't always believe in him. In fact, faith was very, very difficult for me. But even in my unbelief, even in my doubt and resentment, even in my sin, he loved me and he died for me. So I'm here today just as you are because of the cross. I think that's why I felt so strongly about the Gentile question. Uh, shortly after everything happened and the church was born, the question came up about whether Gentile believers like you uh, should be required to follow all of our Jewish customs. There were some who thought that in order for you to become one of us, a follower of Jesus, that you first had to become Jewish. But I didn't think that was so. And so I stood up for what I thought he would have said. I said, no, no, no. Jesus didn't die on the cross so that people could become Jewish. Jesus went to the cross so that people could have their sins forgiven. Salvation is the cross plus nothing. Salvation is a gift of faith that's for all men, women, boys and girls, Jew and Gentile alike, because we're all equal under the cross. That's why it's so good for me to see so many of you Gentile believers here worshiping him today. The other theme you might know me for was actually the title of one of my very favorite sermons. It was called Faith Without Works is Dead. One of the most important things I learned from him was that it's easy to talk about what you believe. It's easy to talk about faith, to say you believe something. Much more difficult, much more important to actually live out that faith in real action. So much of the faith I grew up with was just talk, just the appearance of religion, outward religion. Jesus taught me that real faith is honest and genuine and always produces a changed heart and therefore a changed life. When he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, he really did that. When he said, love your neighbor as yourself, he did that. And when he said, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, I watched him do that. That's why I feel so strongly about putting faith into action, because that's what he did. Much later in my life, I became known as a man of prayer. That's always a bit embarrassing to me, because how could I not be? Prayer is the very lifeblood of faith. Prayer is the very center of my relationship with Him. It's how I talk with Him and how He talks with me. How could I not become a person of prayer? Well, enough about all of that. Let me just tell you my story. I grew up in a large, happy family. Mom, dad, four brothers, and two sisters. My brother's names were Jesus. In our language, it was Yeshua. He was my half-brother, but I'll get into that in just a moment. Then there was Joseph, or Yusuf, and then Jude and Simon. My sister's names were Miriam and Salome. My name, James, was pronounced Jacob. Now, our father was a carpenter, so us boys grew up hanging around the shop, begging to help with the different projects he'd be involved with. And we were little, he'd let us sweep out the shavings from the floor at the end of the day. Maybe he'd give us the leftover blocks of wood to play with his toys. And as we got older, he taught us how to cut wood, how to make corners, how to use all the different tools. And I love the smell of sawdust to this very day. My mother made sure our home was filled with warmth and good food and lots of joy. She loved to sing. She had a beautiful voice. And even to this day, when I lay down at night and shut my eyes, I can hear her voice singing the lullaby she sang to us as children. Like all Jewish families of the time, we went to synagogue every Sabbath day. We celebrated all the feasts and festivals of our people. Our father taught us to love the scriptures, the Torah, and our mother taught us to pray. In some ways, we were just an average family. 
like dozens of other families around Nazareth. But in other ways, I grew up in a very unusual family. I think you would call it a blended family. I was the second born son. My older brother Jesus was just about three years older than me. And like most little brothers, I spent my childhood as far back as I can remember wanting to be just like my older brother. But I also wanted to be different from him. I grew up both idolizing him and competing like crazy with him. I looked up to him and loved him, and I knew that he loved me, but I just couldn't escape being his little brother. When we raced, he was always faster. When we wrestled, he was stronger. When we got to work in our father's carpentry shop, he was better with tools. When we studied the scriptures, he understood more. It just seemed like I could never quite catch up. He was just always that much ahead of me. And I think some of you may be here tonight as younger brothers and sisters know exactly what I'm talking about. But it wasn't just that. There was always something just a little bit different about my older brother. Once when he was 12 and I was about 9, our whole family went to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover feast. It was a trek we did every year as a whole extended family, aunts, uncles, cousins. It took three days, one way just to get there, and we spent a whole week there. It was the highlight of our year. Well, this particular year, everything went as it usually did. Uh, we stayed with friends in Jerusalem. We got to visit the great temple. Uh, we got to watch as sacrifices were offered for the sins of the people. We celebrated Passover meal together. It was wonderful. Then we headed home. At the end of the first day back toward home, uh, something was kind of amiss. We noticed the, the adults were all involved with whispering conversations. There was quite a commotion. Mom and dad seemed to get more and more upset and then we eventually figured it out, Jesus was missing. My parents assumed he was with extended family because sometimes cousins would group together. It's more fun to travel that way than just with your siblings all the time. And they thought he was with my parents. It turns out he wasn't with anybody. He was still back in Jerusalem. So my mom and dad took me, my Aunt Elizabeth and Uncle Zechariah took their son John, and we all went back to Jerusalem to look for Jesus. Now I was excited because I got to go back to the big city made me feel grown up to be able to help. And we spent most of the day getting back, then all day looking for him all over the city. We ended up finally finding him in the temple of all places. He was just sitting in a courtyard surrounded by a handful of old men. When he looked up and saw us coming, he didn't look surprised. He didn't seem to be aware that we would even be looking for him or that he was even lost. It was just weird. I mean, what kind of 12-year-old spends two days sitting with a bunch of old men, priests, and rabbis? It made no sense. My parents seemed very relieved and happy to find him, but they were also a little bit upset. My mother had tears in her eyes as she hugged him, and my father just stood with his arms folded like that, shaking his head. My mom said, how could you do this to us? We've been looking all over for you. And as younger brother, I thought to myself, he's going to be in trouble. <laughs> but I was close enough to hear what he said in response. He didn't seem embarrassed. He didn't seem afraid. He didn't really even apologize. He just kind of said in a matter-of-fact way, didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? I didn't know what he was talking about, but I saw the way my mother looked at him. She didn't seem angry. She didn't seem happy. If anything, she seemed just a little bit sad. She said, let's go home, wrapped her shawl around him, and then we headed home. And I never heard her talk about that day again. He was just different from the rest of us. Well, our father, Joseph, passed away when we were teenagers. And that was hard on all of us, especially on Jesus, I think, because he had to fill our father's shoes and take over the carpentry business. When I was old enough, I went to work with him, first as an apprentice and then as a partner. He was a really good carpenter. Some said he was better than our father. So we always had enough work and we did okay for ourselves. And even though the Romans dominated our land, life was pretty good. Let's fast forward now, maybe 10 or 12 years or so. When Jesus was about 30 years old, when me in my late 20s, he suddenly decided to leave the shop. All he would say was that he felt God had called him, had anointed him to preach good news because the kingdom of God was at hand. Now, we knew that he loved to study the scripture. We knew that he liked to wander off by himself to pray. We knew that he had unusual wisdom when it came to the things of God, but none of us saw this coming. I mean, frankly, I thought it was a little irresponsible. 
I thought it was very irresponsible. First of all, we all worked in the shop. It was our livelihood. Our families depended on the income from our carpentry business. Without Jesus around, I had to take over leadership, and I sort of resented it. He just dropped the bag on me. I mean, he didn't have a wife and family to feed. The rest of us did. He didn't have to worry about anybody but himself. He could go off and do his preaching thing. We all had to stay and do the work. Second, I thought it was just kind of crazy. He started saying odd things like, the Spirit of the Lord is on me. He sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and sight to the blind. He even moved away from Nazareth altogether. He went to Galilee of all places, started hanging around with people like James and John, sons of Zebedee who were fishermen by trade. He even became friends with a tax collector nobody liked named Matthew. And then he was baptized by our cousin John, who himself had become something of a prophet. He was baptized, and then he disappeared. Over a month, we didn't see him anywhere. The next time we saw him, he looked terrible, like he hadn't eaten in a month, but he seemed even more passionate about his new calling. And before long, he had a ragtag group of disciples following him around like he was some sort of traveling rabbi. I'm telling you, it was just strange. But the only one who didn't seem surprised by all of it was our mother. All she would do is sort of nod and get this smile on her face and say, I think he's doing what he was born to do, she would say. I myself had terribly mixed feelings. I loved and respected him, but how can I understand what he was doing? I mean, I love God as much as the rest guy, the next guy, and I believe righteous living was important, but he just went overboard. For a time, I thought maybe he was just in some sort of ultra-religious phase like his cousin John. I thought sooner or later he'd realize, you know, he's got to get back to work, he's got to make a living like normal people, and then he'd come back. But month after month went by, and he didn't come back. It was then I began to wonder if something might be wrong with his head. So I tried several times to talk a little sense into him. But each time he'd just look back at me and smile and say, James, James, the kingdom of God is at hand. Open your eyes, James. Sometimes I admit I would go stand in the back of the crowd when he was teaching or preaching somewhere, partly because I was curious and partly because I missed him. I was there the day, for example, he told a story. He told a story about a man who'd been beaten and robbed while on the way to Jericho. And in Jesus' story, both a priest and a Levite come upon the man who's lying by the side of the road, but they don't stop to help him. And then a Samaritan man comes along, stops, has compassion on the man, and bandages up his wounds and takes care of him. And at the end of the story, Jesus asks the question, now who was a neighbor to the man on the road? And the answer was obvious, the Samaritan. But the whole story was just dangerous. Was he suggesting that we Jews should be better neighbors to the Samaritans? I mean, they didn't even worship in Jerusalem. We hated them and they hated us. Was he trying to say that an unclean Samaritan was a better neighbor to the man than a righteous man of God was? Was he really using a Samaritan as an example of righteousness? I thought about that story for a long time. And I eventually came to three conclusions. One, he was a great storyteller. Two, he's going to get in big trouble if he keeps saying stuff like that. And three, I thought, he's probably right. So for three years, I watched his ministry from a distance. Rumors began to swirl of miraculous healings, and crowds began following him everywhere. Some began saying, he's a prophet. Some began asking, is this the one we're waiting for? <laughs> I would hear that, and I'd just shake my head, prophet? That's my brother. And then I also heard rumors about his birth. And these were a lot more troubling to me than anything else. There were whispers that Jesus had a different father than the rest of us. Terrible thing to say about him. Especially awful thing to say about my mother. Now, I had heard some stuff like that when I was a kid. Some kid at school had taught me in a playground one day. Your brother has a different daddy, and I had to defend the honor of my family with my fists, and I did. I never told my mother about what that kid said. But now I was an adult, and I was hearing it again, and I just wanted to know for sure, so I waited for a time when I could talk to my mom when she was by herself. One night I came home late, and she was still sitting up by the fire. I think she was praying. So I sat down with her, and I said, Mom, it's okay. I, I have something I need to ask you about. 
She said, go ahead, son, as if she knew what I was going to say. But I said, I've heard things. People are saying things about Jesus. They're, they're saying things about you and dad. She looked away for a moment and I stopped. I wondered if I'd crossed the boundary and gone too far. When she looked back, she just reached over and took my hand and she said, James, James, my sweet James, she said. I'm so proud of the man you are becoming, but what I'm going to tell you is going to be hard for you to understand. I said, Mom, it's okay. I love you. You can tell me anything. Just tell me. And then she told me the story. But it wasn't the story I expected. She said that an angel of God had come to her and told her she would have a son and that she conceived when she was still a virgin before she and my dad even came together. She said the angel told her the boy should be named Jesus because he would save his people from their sins. And I listened to her. She was my mother. But I didn't believe her story. As hard as it would have been for me to hear, I just wanted her to tell me the truth. I just wanted her to acknowledge that she and my father got in trouble, had a baby out of wedlock. Instead, it was this crazy story that covered everything all up. I mean, what was I supposed to do with that? Was I supposed to believe my brother was more the son of God than the son of Joseph the carpenter? I didn't want to cause her any more pain. I didn't want to cause her shame. So I didn't say a word. I just gave her a hug and thanked her and left. I had to go find my brothers because we had a lot to talk about. Over the next year or so, things really got kind of out of hand. We almost never saw Jesus. When we did, he was surrounded by his disciples and crowds of people who were just uh, begging him for some sort of miraculous sign or some sort of healing. The Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council, had started to take notice, even called me in for an interview. They said that they respected his ministry, but they were concerned about some of the things he was saying. I said, look, I'm his brother. I'm not one of his followers. I don't know what he's talking about out there. You might want to call him in and ask him yourself if you want to know. And then it all came to a head a few weeks later at Passover. Now at Passover time, all kinds of people flood into Jerusalem by the thousands to celebrate the feast. And when word got out that Jesus and his disciples were going to come as well, it just turned into a kind of bedlam, a mob scene. People lined the streets trying to get a glimpse of him. Some threw their coats on the road and as if he were some kind of royalty. Others were singing songs of praise, Hosanna, Hosanna, like he was the second coming of King David or something. And that was the first time I became truly afraid about what was happening. I celebrated Passover with my family, with my mother, my brothers, and their families. Jesus didn't celebrate with us. He hadn't for a couple of years, ever since he had met his new friends. And so I didn't hear about his arrest until 2 or 3 in the morning when there was a frantic knock on my door. I dragged myself out of bed, opened the door, and it was young John Mark who was breathless and clearly frightened out of his mind. He said, Jesus had been arrested and that Peter had sent him because he thought I should know. I said, arrested for what? He said, the rumor is blasphemy. I said, where'd they take him? He said, they took him to the home of the high priest Caiaphas. He said, Peter just thought you should know. I didn't know what to make of it, so I said, thank you. I put on my coat and I tried to head to my mother's house. I needed to get to her before she heard it anywhere else. Well, I think you're here because you know the rest of the story. It was like a bad dream, a nightmare. It all happened so fast. Jesus was convicted of blasphemy by the Sanhedrin. Then he was sent to Pilate, the governor, and there he was convicted of treason, which was a capital offense. Then he was condemned to be executed, all in a matter of a few hours. I watched it from a distance trying to follow what was going on, trying to be unnoticed. Part of me wanted to run to his side. Part of me wanted to fight to the death for his life. That was my brother. But another way, I was angry. I was angry at him. If he had just listened to me when I tried to talk sense to him, if he had just kept his mouth shut and dropped the whole prophet thing, if he had just been satisfied by being a carpenter, being like the rest of us, then none of this would ever happen. And then they killed him. They crucified my brother like a common criminal. Friday and Saturday night were dark and terrible times. Awful. I barricaded myself in my home with my wife and children. We were all in shock. We were terrified, overwhelmed with grief. 
I had heard they buried his body in the tomb of a rich man named Joseph. So I decided I'd wait till Sunday morning when everybody went back to work to go pay my respects. It'd be safer that way. But I woke up Sunday to another knock on the door very early, and it was John Mark again. This time, he didn't seem to be afraid. He Rather, he seemed excited and kind of happy. I thought it was odd and terribly inappropriate, given everything that had happened. I said, what's going on? He said, James, James, Peter sends word that he's alive. I said, what? Who? He said, Peter wants you to know that your brother is alive. I grabbed him by the, by the shirt, and I said, J John Mark, what are you talking about? He said, please, James, please, just come with me. He wants to see you. I put on my cloak and went with him, mind racing the whole way. We ran through several back alleys, came to a simple two-flat building. Went up the stairs to the second floor, and we were greeted there by Peter the fisherman. I'd only met him a couple times before. He grabbed John Mark in a bear hug, and in his gravelly voice looked at me and said, Shalom, James. And then he said, He is risen. He asked to see you, James. He stepped aside and let me walk into the room. The light was dark, so it took a moment for my eyes to sort of adjust to the light. But when they did, I saw him standing on the other side of the room, looking out a window, his back toward me. He heard me out of the room, and he turned around, and he just said, little brother. Been a long, long time since he called me that, but it was him. My heart was pounding. I wanted to speak, but I couldn't. I wanted to run out of the room because I was terrified, but I couldn't move. I was paralyzed. He came to me, and he hugged me hard and pounded me on the back the way brothers do. Then he said, James, sit down. I know you have to have some questions. I thought I had to be losing my mind. I mean, how could this be? Was this some sort of sick joke someone was playing on me? But when he sat down, I saw his hands. And I saw the small white scar on the index finger of his left hand. When we were kids, we were playing with a saw one day. It slipped, and I sliced open my brother's finger. And then I saw the other scars. Large, angry wounds made only by Roman nails and Roman hammers. It was him. It was then, in that room that day, that he explained everything to me. Who he was, why he came, why he had to die, how and why he rose again, and why he stayed behind in the temple when he was 12 years old. It was just so much to take in. I mean, this was my brother, the one I shared a room with, the one I knew as only a brother can know a brother, and yet I didn't know him at all. I don't know how long we sat there. An hour, maybe two, seemed like a week. And I was finally able to articulate the question that was burning in my heart. I looked at him and said, Brother, are you the one? Are you the Messiah, the Son of God? And he looked straight at me and he said, I am. And with those two words, it was like a great wind blew through my soul, a hurricane of love and forgiveness and life. And I fell to my knees, put my forehead to the floor, and just whispered over and over again, my Lord and my God, my Lord and my God, my Lord and my God. After a few moments, I felt his hands on my shoulders, and he pulled me to my feet. And when I looked up at him, his eyes were full of great laughter and joy and he said, James, my brother, follow me. And I did. 